welcome to my lightning talk on From Factory to Cloud, The Path to Beam. I'm Dan Honey. I'm a principal engineer at Odin Technologies. I work on integrations and partnerships, and previously I'd worked on hardware at Odin. A bit about Odin, we're an industrial analytics platform for manufacturing. Uh, think of us like the new relic for manufacturing. Uh, we work with medium to large manufacturers in verticals like plastic extrusion, injection molding, and metal stamping. We help provide our customers with the ability to centralize and analyze their data and to actually see what the output and cost and logistics are of what it is they're actually making so they can make better decisions. So let's talk about how we started with hardware. Uh, in the beginning, that's all there was. In 2016, I started at Odin as a hardware engineer responsible for basically everything uh, before it touched the cloud. So the development, deployment, troubleshooting, whatever of our fleet of embedded devices. Uh, and I inherited a, a small fleet from my predecessor that was already out there. And I uh, hit the ground running, getting the rest of our factories online. Uh, <clears throat> in the beginning, as you can see from this picture, we were very scrappy in the early days. Uh, we'd basically do whatever it took to get data streaming. And for a while, it worked. Uh, but what did that entail? Uh, so basically, you would just send 20-somethings across the country with a suitcase containing thousands of dollars of hardware, some of which uh, TSA would rummage through and sometimes break for us. Uh, and we would also spin up a, a field deployment team as well uh, that would go out and handle uh, most of the physical deployments. But I would be out there as well with them or on my own uh, assisting in that. And you're talking, on average, 12 to 18-hour days uh, on your feet, on the factory floor with steel toe boots and earplugs, um, just running around, installing equipment, troubleshooting stuff, all into live power cabinets uh, around running machines because uh, these factories run 24 seven and they can't afford you downtime to install a children's toy into their power cabinet. So, you know, you just have to kind of make it work and get things online. Uh, we had a, a growing fleet of devices to maintain and support. So there's a lot of remote updates, troubleshooting, uh, and we ran into a lot of new machines. Uh, most of them had standard industrial protocols, so we could rely on some off-the-shelf open source libraries. Not many, though. Uh, and some <coughs> had their own custom protocols. So there was some software development uh, work towards that that needed to be done to verify and vet how these machines worked. So lots of reading machine manuals and figuring out the best way to get data out of the machine and then convert it and map it into a, a payload that our platform understands, send it to the cloud, uh, and then it would end up in our, in our platform. Um, what you're looking at you know, is our earliest deployment, but eventually we, we got better. We started putting things in cases with better power supplies. We stopped plugging things into walls where they would get unplugged by maintenance staff. Uh, we eventually, for fleet management, ended up using Belena to help manage uh, and, and see our fleet of devices and push uh, updates that was very useful. We even ended up using their, uh, their hardware, their FIN board, which is a, a single board that takes a Raspberry Pi compute module. So we eventually moved away from Pis to compute modules with these industrial boards. And on the left-hand side, you can see our Pis uh, in more of a, a completed enclosure. And on the right-hand side, we actually have a Blana device uh, here, that black box shoved into a, a cabinet living nicely alongside other industrial hardware. Uh, and so that worked well for a little while. So <clears throat> what happened? Well, it worked until it didn't, right? And how bad How bad could such a thing be? So I'm this picture right now uh, is something you probably never want to see when you're dealing with hardware or deployments. It's a, it's a Wi-Fi heat map of a factory in Detroit that does uh, uh, bolts for auto manufacturing. And when you're deploying uh, for this plant in particular upwards of 70, 80 devices, you run into a lot of problems. Uh, a factory is, is mostly metal, uh, a lot of machines, a lot of scaffolding, a lot of stuff to block uh, Wi-Fi, basically. And so you deal with connectivity issues, you deal with customer IT if they don't have enough DHCP leases, things like that. Uh, devices fall online and offline all the time. Uh, and if they fall off the network, we need things like real-time clocks to make sure I'm getting data you know from 2016 and not 1970 uh and we have power surges that'll knock devices offline or sometimes just damage them entirely and take them offline permanently people will unplug your stuff for no reason maintenance guys or, or uh contractors will just unplug it and forget to plug it back in if they're doing work there's a lot of security concerns if you're a customer and you're deploying a ton of these little devices that are on the internet streaming data 
uh, the maintenance of these devices and all the uh, expensive custom converters for some of these machines uh, was also quite a, a logistics feat. And essentially, uh, the TLDR is, is that a fleet of embedded devices is not the same as your server rack in the cloud. And so the, the cracks were starting to show. And so every deployment between the lull uh, surge of, of, uh, of you know, activity, we'd ask ourselves, there has to be a better way. Uh, and slowly, you know, we, we would get better, uh, but e even three years later, it still wasn't enough. And we needed to, we needed to find a solution that was really taking hardware out of the equation uh, because we were spending too much time maintaining it and dealing with situations that were out of our control or that we just didn't have enough visibility into. And so we decided to learn from the industry. Uh, we took guidance from what was happening around us. You know, we needed to catch up to all the other movement that was happening in our space. And so we started an internal initiative. And basically, we came up with an approach to minimize the amount of Odin devices, of Raspberry Pis we were deploying into these factories. We would start to aggregate data uh, into industrial controllers and other off-the-shelf equipment called PLCs or programmable logic controllers. So instead of one device per sensor, you would have like one device per manufacturing line. So you could go from you know 12 to 60 really easily, and that was nice. And at its logical extreme, we used off-the-shelf hardware uh, and software as well to take all the data in the factory to one point. So we really truly eventually only had uh, one device per factory. And this was great because it reduced cost, it reduced our footprint. And eventually it was so good, we pivoted from hardware entirely. You know, our value proposition is really machine learning analytics uh, and, you know, trading a thousand devices for, you know, 50 or hundred factories is great. Um, but we still had a lingering hardware presence. We still had an edge device out there that was doing some of this mapping and some of this comms talk and we needed to solve that problem. So, this is where Apache Beam comes in. Uh, we started a, another initiative called Bifrost. Bifrost is the uh, internal code name for our direct cloud integration. Uh, Bifrost is, is basically, a, it's an Apache Beam job that takes the streaming metrics from factory systems and then does that mapping, flips it, and sends it onward to our pipeline where it gets further processed. So how does it work? Well, before that, we need to look at what we're doing uh, when we had devices. So on the left-hand side, you've got a factory that's got sensor readings, machine comms, that's being centralized to a central or to a, a main server that's uh, speaking OPC UA, which is an industrial protocol. And our, our device would talk to it. And you can see an example of a JSON payload it might receive from that server telling you the melt temperature of, of some extruder or something in a factory. It would then flip it against a config it has so that it knows the proper IDs and customer IDs and things it maps to. And then once that message is formatted, it would send it on to Cloud IoT Core, which is our, our, our Google Managed Services MQTT broker. And from there, it would go into PubSub and Dataflow and, and be processed. So with Beam, we just took that processing, we just put it in Dataflow. We learned to work with, again, a lot of the factory systems around us and created an integration that allows KEP server, or KEPware, which is an OPC UA server, uh, that aggregates data, talks to all the machines for us, uh, that has an MQTT integration that works with Cloud IoT Core. And so it goes to Cloud IoT. And then our Bifrost data flow job will take that up, do the mapping, uh, convert it, and send it onward. So pretty simple. Uh, if we look a bit deeper into what's happening um, from left to right, you'll have the Kepware server sending MQTT data into Cloud IoT Core. That will go to a pub sub channel specific for that factory where the data flow job will pick it up. It subscribes to the events. It'll pull and store the config in beam state. It will then map that data to format the message and then it will publish the events to its topic. And it'll go to the next stage of the pipeline where it gets processed. And so in a nutshell, uh, you know, working with the industry and a lot of the tools available to us off the shelf uh, and really seeing what was available to us allowed us to turn to Beam to solve the problems that before we were solving exclusively with hardware. And it's something that we, we couldn't have done without Beam. Uh, and the visibility that we get, the way we're able to see the data and process it has, has really been uh, a positive change for us. So that's the end of my lightning talk and thank you for listening.